Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another round of sound. This is the 25th anniversary season of the number one Cochrane Sports Showdown. I'm Bob Pompiani. So much to get into. Bob Carrington, Caitlin Clark. We're going to talk about the Pirates, who are eight and two for the first time in six years. But the number one topic tonight is something we didn't expect it to be the number one topic. The Penguins, who have now pushed to be close to the playoffs. Here to discuss is your panel. We have Jeff Hathorne, Sports Director 93.7 The Fan. In the middle, it's Mackey in the middle. Jason Mackey back from Florida. And Chris Muller getting a green for the Masters Week coming up. Not only the shirt, <laughs> but the shoes. <laughs> Thank you for that wide shot. I appreciate we it. We need the wide shot to show Hello, the shoes. Hold on. Hello, friends. Hello, Hello friends. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Can we play a little piano maybe here and really get this thing? They realize at the, at the Masters, it's the jacket that's great. unlike any other. Well, I, it's me, so I'm always backwards. <laughs> I mean, so let's do this. All right, we're going to start with the Penguins. Not too long ago, uh, two weeks ago, in fact, people would have said, there's no way the Penguins are going to be. They were nine points out. What it took was them getting hot, but it also took them, meaning Washington, Philadelphia, anybody in that group falling apart, and they did. Chris, start with you on this. Uh, Five games left. They've fallen behind Detroit, which won today. Uh, will they make it? Do you think they'll make it based on what they have? I actually do think they're going to make it because they'll get a crack at the Islanders and Detroit, so they have the two teams that they can just win directly over. I think 3-1-1 one, and one might get it done. I think that Nashville game is probably the least crucial for a variety of reasons, but it's just wild that we're here. You guys all know this because you're all of the same, you know, an age group that saw this. Malone and Rodman tripping each other up the court in the 98 <laughs> NBA Finals. Yep. That's all these Eastern teams trying to get a playoff spot. And, you know, it's wild. It's goaltending. It's Crosby's pride. I think Malkin's pride to not give up. And it's also guys like Ryan Graves, frankly, being too injured to play. And people they're, stepping been, up in his well, place. No, I mean, it sounds bad, but they've been forced to play young guys and, and guys it who maybe helped. aren't very proven. St. ivany has been really good. Uh, they've gotten a lot of con bunting Ryan has been. Shea. I was going to say, Ryan don't Shea. forget the bunting trade, not the Bunt Gensel trade, the bunting well, trade. Well, so, <laughs> I mean, it's funny, though, guys. We all, I think, are on the same wavelength. Bunting has given them something they really needed, which is a lot of nastiness and scrap around the net. And I, I think they're going to make it. And I was somebody, full disclosure, who was so disgusted I was openly rooting against them. This has been nothing less than a shocking turn of events for them. Oh, yeah, two weeks ago, we're talking about Fire the coach, trade, you know, <laughs> A, B, C, and D all the way down the lineup. One of the biggest things, Pomp, I think, and, and Chris brought this up, it, Michael Bunting and what he's done for Gino, and what, what Gino's parents have done for Gino. <laughs> I mean, all of a sudden, this is more than Soup, a Sydney Cross. Whatever, whatever they're doing, man, keep doing it. Yeah. Um, you know, but they're more than just Sid and whatever else. It, it, the power play is still not there. I think they're going to make it because of how mediocre the Eastern Conference is, but I do think about the way Nedeljkovic has played and what the power play could be, what it could give them if they're even remotely competent there. To me, that's a team that might actually be a pretty difficult out in mm -hmm. the postseason. Yeah, I admit two weeks ago I was in this seat and said that they were done. After that Colorado game, they had a 4 nothing lead and blew it. I thought they are done, it is over, and they have – resuscitated themselves and it's it's all the things you guys have said plus as Mike Sullivan has told us over and over they need to do the little things they are the wall plays um, getting loose pucks being in the red paint you know getting in the goaltender's face all those little things that really get magnified this this time of year they're doing right now the one thing it, we did see is something I never thought we'd see. They were down 3-1 to the Devils in New Jersey. <laughs> Chris, all of a sudden, they went on a five-goal rampage against a team that normally in that building, they don't do that against. So that, I thought, was a turning point for them. But they also needed other teams to just completely fall flat on their faces. And John Tortorella, you know, <laughs> who knows what he's going to be like at the end of the season. Their team can't win. I'm devastated that the Flyers are <laughs> finding themselves in this predicament where their coach is actually being viewed sympathetically for calling them out for the right reasons for how bad they've been. Um, what happened in that Devils game, you, anytime you're on a run like this, you need something unusual and almost inexplicable to happen. Them just erupting for five goals completely out of nowhere. Mainly, if you're going to like point, pinpoint what they did. They did simple things. They just tried to get the puck to the net, tip pucks, do that. Uh, that's the inexplicable part of this. And Jason said, you know, if the power play gets going, they could be dangerous. Here's why I think they're dangerous. At five on five, they've been a pretty good team for most of the yeah, year, yeah. sometimes a very good team. You know what the NHL hates to do in the postseason? Call penalties, that's right. We can't yep. call penalties. We're the officials. You want us to decide the game by, by doing our jobs? So the Penguins actually would thrive, I think, in that situation. And here's another crazy part of this. We all know it's Nadelkovich's goal if they get there. He's the goalie. 
I don't think you can put Ryan Graves back into this lineup. Not right now. If he, Not if he right gets now. healthy, like if Not they right keep now. playing this way the rest of the year, how could you possibly justify that guy getting back into the lineup? I mean, if we've they, seen if this. If they time. lose, because, you know, Mike Sullivan no, but if will they, make if a change. If they get into the playoffs, there is no way Ryan well, Graves road, could be yeah. on uh, that, like, that first night. Of the players. I, I no think way it depends on how it goes, Chris. I mean, he's not going to mess with the winner. We've seen that with Sullivan. He will not do that. It's Nadelkovic's goal. That part is different. I, I think if they do get there and there's a loss and there's an opportunity, I think they want to get Ryan Graves back in. I think they need to get Ryan Graves back in there, but I don't know. To I, what end, though? Like, yeah, why, I know, why I know, I know, I know. Like, I think I he's been miscast from the start. But it, you're paying him $5 million bucks. You're not going to pay him $5 million bucks to be a healthy scratch in the press box. I'm guys, what, what we're seeing is, other than the top two teams, and even they have a couple of flaws, all the other teams are majorly flawed, including the Penguins. Right. Yes. And now those teams, are they're finding, they're committing the, the issues. They're not doing the things that they were doing earlier in the year. Their flaws are being exposed, and all of a sudden, now the Penguins are hot. We got uh, about a minute and a half. I want to ask you this. I know Nadalkovic is the hot goalie. He should play. But Mike Sullivan is always makes me wonder. He, he doesn't like letting a guy sit forever. There are five games left in this season. Tell me how many games Nadalkovic plays, assuming he plays well again tomorrow and then whenever. Uh, will he play all five? Should he play all five? I don't think he should. I'd actually play Jari tomorrow, who has, I think, a shutout on his resume against the Blue, uh, the Blue Jackets, the Maple Leafs. Excuse me. You're still blue. I want, I want to say right. the Blue. I almost said the Blue Jays. I was like, uh, oh, you should have seen him whiff Guerrero. Jr. Guerrero, yeah. 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 Uh, the Blue no, Leafs. I'd actually, I'd actually play him against the Leafs. Uh, but I'd give Nedeljkovic four out of the five. If you're going to play yeah. Nedeljkovic tomorrow, then sit him against the Predators, which is by definition the least impactful of these games. But he can't play any fewer than four of the five. I'd probably like to see Jari get a game just so he's fresh for the play. I don't know if I'd go tomorrow, though. I really wouldn't. I think I, I would ride this out with Ned. At some point Plus it's going to come. Plus three days before the Detroit game, too. So. Yeah, I mean, at some point it's probably going to reach a conclusion. I just can't. I, I don't. I don't mess with the winner, and I think that's yeah. the way Sullivan is. I just, if you're winning, I'm, I'm rolling the same lineup out. Listen, guys, they've been in a playoff series for two weeks, <laughs> and when you're in the playoffs, you ride the hot hand. Yeah. I would give them all five, assuming that he continues to play well. None of them are back. This is the postseason right could. now. They, they've been in the postseason for a couple of weeks. You ride that hot hand. All right. Speaking of hot hands, we're talking about the Pirates now. Eight and two. When we come back, we're going to shift the uh, discussion to the Pittsburgh Pirates, who won again today. Three straight series wins. Is this sustainable? It's coming up next right here on the number one Cochrane Sports Showdown, so don't go away. All right, the Pirates have won eight out of ten. They've won three series. They have three extra inning wins. They have three walk-off wins. Break up the Bucks, Jason Mackey. Uh, let's start with you on this one. How sustainable is an eight and two start? We've seen in previous years. In 2018, same start. Last year, 20 and eight. What, what are we looking down? Well, I hate to be the bearer of bad news here, Pump, but I don't think the Buckos are going to win 80 percent of their games this season. <laughs> uh, that's that's my sustainability doesn't necessarily mean 80 percent, but no, it does I know, mean... I know. Now, look, I picked the Pirates to win 83 games at the beginning of the season, and I, I I don't feel any differently about their chances. Do I think they're going to be a halfway decent baseball team? Yes. I mean, 80 percent is just an unrealistic clip. I am sort of amazed, surprised, something. They've gotten really good starting pitching. And if that would somehow continue, boy, are we having a different conversation. I thought mm -hmm. this team was going to be able to score some runs. I actually thought they were going to defend well, which they have not done. They haven't played great defensive no. or fundamental baseball. Hmm. But the starting pitching, oddly, has been very including good. Including Bailey that, Falter. Including Bailey Falter. And if that continues, again, I, I think that is the key to sustaining this. I think you could argue Washington and Miami and say, okay, how good are these teams really, even though Miami made the playoffs last year. Baltimore's really good. And they took two out of three. They had to have walk-offs. They had to come back. They had to extend it to 11 innings, but they found a way to win. What it's encouraging to me is it's not one or two people that are so hot that they're carrying this team. They're getting contributions from a lot of different people on this roster. That, to me, including young, young players who I think are stepping up at times. I don't, I'm not saying that they're going to win 90 games, but I think I had them at 81 games, maybe a few ticks higher than that. Yeah. I mean, I had him at 74 and 88 as the ultimate cynic because I just was so frustrated by what they didn't do to the rotation in terms of established help in the offseason. But I have to go a couple ticks higher. And I thought last year's team was a legit 20 and 8 because they were bashing teams' brains in. You looked at the run differential. They looked mm -hmm. like a 20 
and 18. But I think what's good about this, the Orioles series, you've got them guys, they're winning games with adversity. Bad teams lose both of these games yep. and get swept. Uh, better teams find a way to dig themselves out of it like they did today, even though it required one of the strangest plays I think we've ever seen a game end on. The one thing I think that you have to be extremely encouraged about is the guy that signed the extension that was supposed to be their horse early in the season has given you two bad starts by his standards. You're one and one in those games. I mean, the fact that Gonzalez has gone out there and looked pretty good, Falter has hung in there for you and looked good. The reason I'm more optimistic than I was last year is help should be on the way. His name is Paul Skeens. I think we've heard of him. Yeah, and since yeah. you brought that up, let's talk about that. So far, six innings, 11 strikeouts. Jason, uh, you saw him down in spring training. It looks like he's ready right now, but obviously that won't happen. When will it happen? Pump, I don't think this is about development in AAA, and it can't be. I watched a lot of Paul Skeens in spring. He is, if not the best, darn close to the best pitcher in the organization. I mean, he is a major league caliber player. Now, that being said, he's a very important major league caliber player, and I think they do have a, a system that they're implementing and a schedule building towards something. They're basically shaving off innings at the front end of his season so they don't have to shut him down at the end. To a degree, I understand that. They're also being excessively cautious with him. He's a big investment. So, okay, you don't want to get him hurt. I think when he builds up to around six innings, he's at three transitioning to four in his next start mm -hmm. down in Indianapolis, I think you're going to see him. So it's, it's not far off, and it's not about development. you got to wonder with Bieber and Strider's injuries, too, if that reinforces in their mind, like, okay, this is, it. to your point, a huge investment. Let's be cautious. And you know what? Yeah. Bailey Falter bought them five more days where right. – you know, yep. he, was, he was the guy that you were looking, okay, he's got to replace him. Falter basically threw a no-hitter through six innings. He was really good. Yeah, and those other two guys, the veterans, Martin Perez and also Gonzalez, have been very solid. Perez has been guys, outstanding. Uh, MVP of the Pirates through eight games. Who would it be? To me, I, I told Jason it would be Cruz originally because well, I just I, – what he means. But Connor Joe would have to get some votes on this. You know what? I'll go off the, the board then. I'll go Michael A. Taylor. I know he's gotten a couple days off in a row. I know he's in his you know, early, mid-30s, but I think the guy's been pretty good in center field. Big hits, professional baseball, setting that example. I think Joe's a good pick, obviously, but I'll go Michael A. Taylor. Why not? Do I have to go next? Go ahead. <laughs> All right. Um, I'll go Cruz, Pump. I'll go Cruz. I think Connor Joe is up there as well, um, but I've been so impressed with the maturity of Cruz. And it's not just the, the tape measure home runs. We know that's in there. It's everything else. And the defense has been so-so. It's been so-so dating back to February. I don't even really care about that. I care about using the opposite field. I care about swinging at the right pitches. I care about getting on base, being a functional leadoff hitter, and being able to drive the ball. He's done all of that. What that does for their offense so much. Yeah, there have been a, a lot of guys that have made contributions. I think Jared Jones. I love the fact that here's a young guy. And he is shoved in two outings. He, he is aggressive. He sets a mindset for the rest of that team. Comes down with the shirt I'm buttoned to here. And he's I love just it. throwing gas. And he's just basically doing with two pitches right now. I, I think him, because of the way he's pitched, that he's a young guy, that he won a spot, and that he brings an attitude to this team, I think Jared Jones. One minute left. Chris, I want to ask you about a least valuable, or are you concerned at all about guys like McCutcheon, Sawinski, Henry Davis, even though he's – He's got a lot on his plate right now. I, I don't worry so much about him. Who, who are you concerned about? I'm a little concerned about Davis. I know you said, you know, I think McCutcheon's the obvious one. One of the guys might want to take that. But Davis is a guy that I think they're counting on to be a pretty major offensive contributor. I don't even know if they would have said that about McCutcheon before the season started. I do need to see Henry Davis hit. And frankly, I need to see him hit for some real power. So I think he's my main concern just because he's not a guy in his mid-30s. He's right. supposed to be a building block. I would mostly agree with Chris, but just to give a little bit of variance in there, I'll go with Jack Sawinski for now. I, they have a tough outfield situation because Michael A. Taylor has been really good. Brian Reynolds, you're obviously going to play him a lot. Edward Olivares, you saw it today in the past couple of games. Like He's a very good player. Mm -hmm. To balance all of that, get Connor Joe in the lineup as well. Sawinski's playing time is kind of get, getting crunched, and I think it's hurt him. I think Mitch Keller. I mean, their ace is the guy in AAA with the mustache, uh, but he's got to be better for them. They need him to kind of set an example and be better in his opportunities. The velocity that starts being tomorrow down. night. The velocity yeah. being down too yeah. is just. I'm keeping my eye on that because this, these Tommy John stories you're reading. I just I'm on high alert with almost everybody with that right now. Plus, he's coming off a bad second half of the season after a good first half of the season tomorrow. Detroit in town. They're off to a pretty good start as well. When we come back, we're going to talk about uh, two people specifically, Bub Carrington and Caitlin Clark, and their decisions to go to the next level. Good decisions, bad decisions. That's next right here on the number one Cochrane Sports Showdown.
All right, we're back talking about basketball uh, tomorrow night. It's the men's final today with South Carolina beating Iowa. Caitlin Clark, she's on her way to the WNBA, even though she has one year left of eligibility. Jeff, I want to ask you about not only her, but Bob Carrington after his freshman season. He's moving on as well. Is that a good decision for both of those players? Because there's so much NIL money available you can make more in college than you would in the pros. It certainly would be the case with Caitlin Clark. Well, neither of them have to go to school anymore. So that's one thing that that's off their plate. And I think that is a little bit of a consideration. I realize she could have made more at Iowa, but I think you also get to the point. She carried college basketball this year. All the interviews at halftime post game, and she did a great job of it. She can go to the WNBA, play with better players. While she will have attention, it won't be quite like it was for her in college. For Bub Carrington, if he gets those reports that you know, Jeff Capel mentioned, and he's going to be a first rounder, and that's his goal. Mm -hmm. Go. Don't second guess yourself. Go. I'm a little disappointed they both made the decisions they did, and I struggle with whether it's my place to say they made a good one or they didn't. But, you know, if you're, if you're in Caitlin Clark's place, don't, don't you leave college with a little bit of a bitter taste in your mouth? You want to win a championship. Mm -hmm. You know, and she never did that. You can have the individual accolades. You can talk about carrying women's college basketball, but you never won a title. And Bob Carrington, I guess I get it with Jeff Capel and what he said about the reports, but at the same time, Pitt basketball has a chance to do something really special here. And I thought maybe you stay for another year, and then, I mean, you were a for sure lottery pick at that point. But it's a loaded guard class next year. That's the only thing I would think would be Yeah, but if you play well enough, should, that shouldn't well, matter. Well, maybe not. I don't what Caitlin Clark did for women's college basketball and women's basketball writ large is bigger than a championship for her individually in the team sense or however you want to put it. Uh, people were having the right kind of arguments man, these refs suck, I hate this. This is, why are they make, not making this call? This game is great, don't ruin it. She did more for that sport than she ever could have. She should try to do the same thing now for the WNBA, capitalize, because now everyone knows a lot of other players in women's college hoops because of Caitlin Clark, so they can carry the torch. Carrington, next year's draft, 2025, it's ultra strong. Cooper Flag, all those guys, he's gotta go now. He's a projectable guard. I'd take him in the top 10 or 12 if he tests well and shows he can make outside shots. Both of them made the right decision. All right, let's talk real quick. One minute, quick assessment, Jeff, <laughs> on moving screens. They called it in that game against uh, UConn. Iowa made out on that. I thought it was right. probably the technically right call, but I also thought the Iowa person really did uh, embellish it, too. All right, in the moment, I thought, man, Mick, you make that call. But then as I've seen the replays, it was the right call. And here's the other thing to consider. <laughs> Let them play. Shouldn't the, the defender get the opportunity to play as well without being yeah, interfered? No call would have yep. been good, too. Chris, you mentioned earlier about NHL officials swallowing their whistles in the playoffs. I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. I would have liked to seen that in college basketball. I think men's game, women's game, whatever. They get a little too involved. I'd rather see the players play. But you're determining the game if you don't call a penalty or a foul that should be in called. In that case, though. She stuck her leg out. That's uh, the real problem. She stuck her leg out. All right. We'll see. Uh, <laughs> Caitlin Clark will be off to the WNBA. We're going to talk about what's next. I forget. Oh, we're going to talk about the Masters. <laughs> the Masters. How about that, Bob? <laughs> I forget. Ah. We'll be right back. <laughs> Stay tuned. All right. 25 years ago, uh, this is April 9th, 2001. Actually, it wasn't quite 25 years ago, but during our number one Cochrane Sports Showdown, we saw the opening of PNC Park. This was the video. Remember Kevin McClatchy. All right, I want to talk about the Masters. Chris, you wore green in, so therefore we should talk about it. This great story today of this kid, uh, Akshay Batia. He's 22. Mm -hmm. He was there for the National Drive Chip Championship yep. 10 years ago. Now he gets a chance to play. Who's your pick? Scheffler. I mean, the guy. All right, let's take Scheffler out of the conversation. Uh, I, would wow. actually say, I would actually say Batia has a good chance because I feel like guys who win their way in the week before typically play well at the Masters. And somebody who knows golf really well told me he's a lefty, so he has a huge advantage being able to cut the ball at Augusta National, which is a right-to-left, right-handed ball flight right. paradise. So I'll take him. Why not, Bob? Okay. I'm going to go with Brooksy. I'm with Kepka because Almost I want a live. Year. I want a live guy to win, so we can finally get these tours back together and get some Paul's more popularity <laughs> in in golf. Plus, it would cap off a great week for Dick Grote and his family going into the, the way, Hall he, of Fame yeah, yeah, with, with Bill, Bill Hillgrove, Hillgrove. and then. Have Brooks. You know what golf needs always is a good villain. He is the best villain in golf when he's winning. And he's subtle because he because he yeah. just acts like he doesn't care, and you know he does badly. Pomp, I bet you can't guess who I think is going to win. Um, Tiger Woods. 
No, don't say Tiger Woods. <laughs> Whatever you say, Tiger Woods. <laughs> I need a eight. suggestion for who I think is Roy McAvoy from Tin Cup. Just say yeah. Rory McIlroy. All right. Close he's enough. good, right? Oh, no, very yeah, good. Roy, Roy Never had any guy. tortured history okay. at the Masters either. Don't <laughs> right. worry. Good. That's my pick. My pick's going to be a, a lefty, but not. Although I would like to take Oxay, the young kid. I'm going to go with Brian Harmon. He's a lefty. He's a grinder. He does all the things you want to do. Down Man, the I want to pick him. You'll see all this coming up this week on KDK. <laughs> Meantime, to earn a great nickname, you have to do things bigger and better. That describes all four number one Cochrane Ford stores. They're called the Ford Tastic Four because customers can enjoy four times the pricing power, four times the selection, and four times the thrills. Plus, get limited time offers right now. The Ford Tastic Four have it all. So visit any four of the number one Cochrane Ford stores or shop online. You can do it at Cochrane.com. We'll be right back. What did I? All right, before we go, there is a national championship game coming at you tomorrow. So, Jeff, I'm going to start with you. You got Purdue, you got UConn trying to make it back to back. Who wins? Go East Morton, but uh, UConn will win. Ooh, discounting the Butler kid. I'm going Purdue. Zach Eady, Matt Painter, love it. Wow. I want to see the Boilerman. All right, have you seen? I love Ethan's my guy, but. He's not getting a ton of runs, so Matt Painter is unfortunately discounting him. Donovan <laughs> Klingon. I'm sorry. Not yet. Not yet. Klingon Big can really Monday. play. They're going to rout Purdue. They are the best by far. <laughs> they are, and they showed it to you. They've been blowing everybody out. We'll see how it goes. Thank you for joining us. We'll do it again next Sunday night, and by then we'll have a better grasp of the Penguins and their playoff. Do? That's coming up next Sunday night. Good <laughs> night. Like Thank you for joining us. More like Perdon, Jason. Oh.